Uh, it's exciting to be with you all on this uh, Wednesday. Um, it's, <laughs> it's hard to keep track of the days, of course. Um, it's exciting to be with you all on this Wednesday afternoon. Um, I'm here with uh, a return guest of ours. Uh, I, I hope you recognize him because I know I had a good, uh, fantastic time last time we spoke. Uh, Damien uh, Shields is back uh, to talk uh, about more uh, Irish Americans in the Civil War and in particular uh, international pensioners for what I think would be a good time. So welcome back, Damien. Yeah, cheers for having me back. It's great, great to be back on. I'm in, enjoying these. Should be good fun. Yeah, I know. I've, I've had a blast doing them, not just with you, but with a, a host of other people. And I hope that you, yes, you out there have, have enjoyed them as, as, much as, uh, as much as we have. Um, before we get into um, our main topic of conversation today, um, just want to say, of course, uh, thank you for watching. Please like the video. Please share the video. Um, that goes so much towards uh, helping spread our reach. Uh, I know our, our Facebook page has grown uh, exponentially over the last several months. And if you're watching this and you haven't liked us on Facebook to get notifications when we go live and all this sort of stuff, uh, go ahead and like us on Facebook either now or, or when we finish up the program. So that would be uh, exciting. If you want to go back after we finish up here with Damien to watch the one that we did with him, I think back in June, you can do that. That's on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, along with a host of other exciting and interesting uh, interviews, conversations, virtual battlefield tours. Um, it, it's it's been uh, it's been a lot <laughs> over the last several months. So check all those out and like our Facebook page if you haven't. And the other. A uh, great way to support us, if you can, is to become a member uh, of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Um, your membership dollars go to support programming like this to keep our doors open uh, to the public uh, and uh, bring incredible programming like this to you. So thank you so much for those who have joined. Uh, love it. Uh, if you haven't yet joined, um, now is a, a great time to do so. Um, I see some people already chiming in the, in the comments. Uh, Barbara from New Jersey, June from New Hampshire, Bob from Central Virginia, Lee from Indiana, Robert from Claremont, Florida, and of course we've got Damien with us today over in Cork, Ireland. So uh, we got quite the crew today. Quite the spread. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We're, we're all over the place, which is uh, half the fun of these. Um, also, one other quick plug before we get started here. Uh, I'll be back with you all tomorrow um, talking about strange tales of Civil War medicine, really leaning into the Halloween vibe. Um, where, uh, it's going to be strange, true, creepy, gross stories uh, from Civil War medicine, talking about pus and amputations and burial of the dead and all that good stuff. So um, hopefully you tune in with us. That'll be tomorrow at three o'clock Eastern time. So I hope to see you all then. Um, uh, so with all that said, um, let's go ahead and start talking uh, about uh, international pensioners. Um, we have some exciting maps um, ready for you today and, and primary sources. And Damien's got his uh, pieces of papers splayed out on his desk like a, Strewn around me. Like a conspiracy theorist. It's going to be a good time today. Um, so we, we covered this a little bit in the previous video, but um, Damien, you're the moving force behind IrishAmericanCivilWar.com. Uh, I think uh, by far and away one of the best uh, online resources about uh, the Irish experience in the American Civil War. Um, we talked about in the previous video what a huge undertaking that was, but as kind of little offshoots from that uh, website, you've come up with a number of other projects, including the Widows in the Atlantic project, which we'll talk about today. But uh, are there any other kind of little offshoot projects that, um, that, that are on there? Yeah, I, I, I kind of, I'm a big fan of databases and creating things on Excel spreadsheets over the period of months and things like that. So I always, uh, I'm, I'm always engaged in little bits and pieces like that. So um, yeah, things like Widows in the Atlantic uh, um, world is one of the big ones. I suppose the other big one, which is one that I'm hoping to, to drive forward is, is mapping Irish veterans. 
Um, and so specifically, I started that one looking at a, an individual county um, in Ireland, an Irish county called County Donegal up in the northwest of Ireland, um, and started to map known locations within the county where it's known that Civil War soldiers came from or where pensions were received and things like that to try and start to build. I'm always keen to try and build these maps of, of places outside America that are impacted by the war. So that's one of the other big ones. But there's a lot of different visualization stuff, you know, and I go off on little tangents now and again. But the, the stuff that's coming under the umbrella, umbrella of widows in the Atlantic world is definitely the biggest of them at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and the whole uh, the map aspect of it, too, is, I, I think, particularly exciting because, you know, it, uh, you know, sometimes it can it can be challenging. Um, you know, in the field of history um, to like really engage people who are visual learners. It's just this kind of different dynamic that I think is really uh, helpful and fascinating to kind of look at. Yeah, I, I, I think visualizations and particularly seeing things on a map are an amazing way of, of looking at stuff, you know. You can do it for almost everything as well. Like I, I remember a few years ago, I did one on just the 63rd New York who were one of the Irish Brigade regiments mm -hmm. and took their full roster and just mapped where people died and where people um, were wounded and stuff like that. And you just see this, like, obviously this explosion of, of contact points around Northern Virginia and stuff, but it's really just immediately hits you about scale and, and where things are happening and stuff. Um, you know, they, they have some limitations. You have to give context to stuff as well, but they can be very dramatic. And I think particularly when people are looking for stuff to tie in to a local area. So one of the reasons I, I, I I think I touched on it last time, but if I didn't, one of the reasons, for example, the American Civil War isn't that well known in Ireland is people really are interested, are connected to history that happens around them a lot of the time. And I mm -hmm. think you don't know that the guy down the street was in the Civil War or whatever, it, it's, it's more difficult for them to make a connection to it. And that's one of the things, for example, mapping stuff in Ireland to show how the American Civil War can be mapped in countries outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's such a great point and something that I'm certain we'll touch on as we go here um, is, you know, it, it is the American Civil War, the vast majority of it is fought, of course, in the continental United States, but um, there is a, a very distinct global dimension to this, which mm -hmm. has really kind of um, been coming into vogue in the last kind of 10 years. People are really starting to uh, explore it. Uh, and there's a, there's a great book uh, by Don Doyle, um, blanking on the title of the book, but it's all- <laughs> As it's all, mine, I was only looking at it yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's all about the international dimensions of the Civil War. So, so this yeah. is kind of um, one of the kind of hot things to study. And, and there's so much out there as these maps, I think, that we'll look at today demonstrate. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a hugely global conflict and not not just an American war. That's the point, you know, it's fought. And if you look at the Navy and stuff, sure, you know, one of the most famous actions off Cherbourg and stuff at the Kearsarge in the Alabama. So, like, I mean, there's all those aspects, never mind all of the monetary elements and things like that that are brought in. Um, but, yeah, definitely, and something maybe we'll touch on when we're looking at some of the maps, but the impact it has on the working classes, particularly in Europe, is immense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I looked it up because I it was going to bother me. It's called the Cause <laughs> of All Nations. That's is, it. That's the one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Don Doyle's book. It's really, really good. Would highly recommend reading it. Um, so as we uh, talk about the Widows in the Atlantic project, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up, um, uh, pull up the uh, the main map associated with that. We have a number of of different maps here. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, pull up. This is the the main map that you you uh, put together for this um, yeah. as we, and so people can kind of take all this in um, as we get into talking about this, what was your inspiration for kind of creating this map and kind of looking into this subject material? Well, well I, I think we talked before um, about, about how I started accessing the pension files about, oh, it's nearly 10 years ago now because I, I, I like to do primary research and it's very difficult to do primary research in the American Civil War when you're oh. on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean from where the archives are. Um, and so it, it was almost a kind of an accident of going through files and I began to find the occasional file, I was looking specifically at Irish ones at this point, um, like the occasional file that was being paid out in Ireland. And now this was something that there was really very little work done on, um, nothing really on the pensioners. It had been mentioned in a couple of books, but um, kind of engaging with those type of stories and seeing some of the, the 
impacts the war had on people who may never have even been in the United States started to get me thinking about the potential of, of doing something wider. And one of the things, annoying, saying it annoys me would be too strong a word, but one of the things I think is common um, among people who study the American Civil War is talking, you know, they'll talk about its impact on Americans. And it's always Americans and Americans and Americans. It's actually, if you read the first paragraph of a lot of books, it talks about that as, a, as, as, as an American thing. And the reality is, is that the American Civil War and the wars that were fought actually had an impact on a lot of people who were not Americans. If you were working class from particularly the German, what's now Germany, the German states, particularly mm -hmm. Ireland and places like Canada, it had a huge impact on working class people who never saw the United States in their life. They may never have left with two miles from their small shabine of a house um, before but the civil war impacts them. And so it was trying to get at those stories that, that inspired me to look at it. And I started with mapping Ireland. So it's all based around um, a source that was produced in 1883 um, by Act of, Act of Congress, a Congress requested it rather. Um, and they wanted a list of all the people who were then in receipt of American military pensions. And the vast bulk of those people were American Civil War veterans. And so it includes the veterans themselves and it includes the widows and the dependents who I spend, <clears throat> excuse me, most of my time working on. And so I said, OK, I'll start going through that systematically for everybody in the world listed in that outside of the United States. And this map, um, the dots, each of them represent one of the pensions. There's a little under 900 of them that are being paid out. So it's a, it's a snapshot of uh, just th th that time in 1883 um, and there's because it doesn't look there's two that aren't on this is one in Australia and one in Brazil but it includes all the all the others um, and it just shows you like particularly with the Canadian um, Irish and the German ones just a sheer impact that the war has on these people mm -hmm. yeah no uh, no no question about that and and to the point about the visualization I mean this really drives that that point home, and that's uh, that whole theme is something we're very passionate about talking about at the uh, at the museum. Um, one of our locations, the Pry House Field Hospital Museum um, on Antietam Battlefield. That's um, a large portion of what we talk about there is the civilian impact of the battle. Mm. Um, these battles uh, don't solely concern you know, just the armies and, and even the medical departments. It, in, it includes the people that live in the surrounding area. And as you're getting at here, it impacts even a much wider scale than that, the people that live on the home front or even in other countries, uh, yeah. which is uh, an, an uh, under, under talked about point. Uh, d d like it, d communication, it was, uh, it's actually, it was for something different. I was only reading it again um, about two or three days ago, but uh, of a, an illiterate Irish woman who, who lived in a place called Boyle in County Ross Common. And she gets a letter written to her from her nephew in New York that comes kind of, so it's contained a few weeks news that she's illiterate. Her nephew is semi-literate, so they're not writing very often. And in the same letter that's just brought rocks up to her door in, in Boyle, she finds her husband who has gone to America in advance of her um, had been wounded in the peninsula and had been taken prisoner and had been exchanged back and had died um, when he was on the process of going back to the north. And so the nephew starts out the letter, like straight to the point saying, oh, bad news, Farrell Hogg has been, has died. And then he says, and I have worse news that your son um, who was in the Union Navy got back to New York having been taken supplies down on the ship down, down, um, down south. Uh, and fell down a hatchway and he was dead as well oh. and so getting this letter coming across the Atlantic from you know somewhere they, and you see it even in they're not aware of locations per se or, or events a lot of the time and they're trying to communicate this stuff and we'll be getting onto it later but obviously that creates its own issues for these type of people but that you know that's a colossal life-changing impact on that woman um, to, to get this news all, all at once in this really short matter of fact letter you know that, that this her life has changed forever mm -hmm. yeah it's uh, incredible how <laughs> you know it often goes that way sometimes your life can just kind of turn on a dime like that yeah yeah, um, yeah. and the widow's files are never it's always it's always a bad it's never a good outcome for these for, for, for the women in the widow's files it's always uh, it's always the worst possible outcome right um I mean, obviously, uh, pension records would 
uh, probably contributed heavily to this project. And then this source mm -hmm. that you mentioned, you know, where Congress requests, you know, the, you know, everyone, you know, the information on everyone receiving pensions. Yeah. Um, what other sources did you consult? I mean, I guess if you had names, you could kind of dive a little further into kind of specific stories. But yeah, any, any other sources you consulted for this? Yeah, you have to use a broad range. And actually, I'm still in the midst of the Canadian ones, but I've done it for Europe. So what you have in Europe is just, so you just have the name of the pensioner, the amount they're given when, when, it, when it was awarded um, and their location, their postal address. So for the European ones, and I, I, dialed, I, I removed the veterans out of it, I'm just looking at the widows and the dependents, but I, I decided to link them to the events and to the individual in service. So that requires um, a significant amount of additional work, particularly, so you may have the access directly to the pension, but a lot of the pensions are digitized. So, so you have to go and look for the, the units that it's tied to, where he served, what happened, um, looking at newspaper return, uh, uh, newspaper clippings, looking at census returns, try and build up a picture um, of what was going on. So that's been done for Europe. Um, and a lot of the information I had on that was um, done up, the Civil War Monitor magazine did a, a graphic based around that um, in the summer, um, just past, that looks at some of this. And it, it kind of pulls out a lot of interesting things about what's impacting people more, more than others, you know? So you're seeing that around about half and half, that's the one, yeah. So you're seeing some of the facts and figures there um, in, in relation to like the German states, as you would probably expect has the highest number of um, dependents there with about 214 um, followed by Ireland. And there's nowhere else that matches um, <laughs> either of those two um, geographic blocks. And, you know, it brings out interesting things. So we know, we're well aware that the Germans and the Irish serve in the highest numbers from Europe, um, anywhere. But mm -hmm. it, it, you, get, you ask interesting questions of this type of information. So, so there's, there's six in Sweden, um, um, or sorry, eight in Sweden, one in Norway, one in Denmark. But we know quite a few Scandinavians served as well, but they're not claiming the pensions. And so you have to start to think about what's influencing pension claims. And, and that's one of the things that has really interested me in, in looking at this project. So what it suggests is, to me, it's, it's communication networks are vitally important to this. So the Irish and the Germans, and actually you see them reporting on this in places like New York when they want to bring them, um, when they want to, there's a suggestion to put recruiting directly on the docks um, the minute that the immigrants step off the boat. And um, in New York, they go, no, don't do that. The Germans and the Irish will write letters home instantly and tell their people not to come here. Don't do it. And so we know there's really strong ties between the Germans and the Irish that they're staying in constant communication with people. And so people are becoming aware of their entitlement to a pension because of those networks surviving. And they're not as strong, perhaps, in some other places. And one of the other big um, things that seems to influence whether you get a pension or not is, is you really needed to have access to an American consul. So a lot of the big cities or cities that were on the uh, big port towns of, or, or, or so on would have an American consul. So someone who could be a representative of the United States. So out my window here, just opposite um, where I'm looking is what was Queenstown Harbor. It was a huge harbor here. Um, the Kearsarge was anchored here shortly before she, she went and, and um, did in the Alabama. But uh, there was a consul there. And so you have a decent enough number of people who are able to claim pensions in this area because the consul is accessible to them. So that's another one. Um, so I think having the language as well is a big thing. So you see in some of the pension files that the Germans are getting their pensions are even being translated. Sometimes they have forms that are in German for them. So there's a big aid for them there that I think, you know, we know there are people who are further east of uh, where, where these German states are who are serving in the war, but they're, they're, they're not aware that they're able to claim the pension. So, but it's still, it's giving you some sort of idea, but all of these different things, um, one of the interesting things when you start to dive down actually into what men are dying of is really fascinating. So if you can just see down the bottom, the classification of wartime deaths there um, of, of the Europeans, about 44% of them are combat and 56% of them are disease or accident related. But the one that really interested me more than any other is that if you take the top five deaths, causes of deaths that led to the claim of pensions in Europe, uh, Andersonville accounts for one in four 
of that top five number. It is far and away the place that causes, it knocks every battlefield out of the park. Andersonville is just um, a, a death camp in terms of uh, European pensions. And I'm sure as we know, um, because so many men died there, it just dwarfs any of the other um, places. And Salisbury, um, it comes in, it's tied third. So Fredericksburg and Cold Harbor and stuff are there. Yeah, that that's fascinating. It, it like uh, I mean, because obviously, other prison of war camps were pretty horrific as well. Uh, is there was there just like a higher concentration of European soldiers being kept at Andersonville? There, do we know? There's there's a couple there, and I've actually speaking of other projects. Andersonville is another project I'm working on. I'm starting by looking at the Irish who are buried in Andersonville for the numbers. There's a couple of things to it. Number number one is it, it, it more do die there by some degree than anywhere else. But number two is, and there's very little work done on it. And again, it's something I think that this touches on a bit um, for us and it's kind of a, another bugbear and, and a bit of a hobby horse of mine, um, is the late war recruits. And, and you get a lot of immigrant men. Immigrants are carrying the, the heavy lifting um, of late war recruiting to, to large degree. They're not, they're not really thanked for it, it must be said. They're seen as mercenaries coming in after 1863, 1864, 1865. But of the little amount of work that has been done, um, people like Tyler Anbinder and, and people have looked at, at some of the figures, um, it, it seems to be that they're, they're greatly overrepresented in terms of their proportions in guys who are willing to enlist as substitutes and stuff. And a lot of the guys who end up in Andersonville are late war, you know, 1864 prisoners. Um, so you do get decent numbers of them there. Um, as a result of that as well. Um, so, that, I mean, that's one of the things that you see with the pensions. There, there are a lot of early um, enlistees. So, for example, a, a clump of the German um, pensions, one of the biggest battles, actually, that you get out of the German states is the Battle of Cross Keys, which is not one that you would go, oh, that's going to be, if we're going to say, what are going to be the biggest battles in Europe? But it was because German regiments suffered particularly badly at that battle. And, and so it leads to it being quite high on a European um, scale. But uh, you do then do see these late war um, um, battles as well cropping up. So like if you had an area for just the overland campaign, it would, it would, be, it it would come second if you clumped all of those um, battles together. Um, so yeah, it, that kind of interesting aspect where you're seeing men choosing to leave to, because of the financial um, rewards that are available. There's been untold damage done to, I think, by the, the Gangs of New York film. I'm sure everybody's probably seen it. But there's a scene in that where the Irish um, get off the boat um, and are effectively just, they get off the boat and they walk up and they're handed a musket and they turn around, they don't know what's going on, and they're being sent off south to fight in the war while there's a bunch of coffins there. And it kind of makes out, you know, that they're, that they're not the smartest and they don't know what's going on. And... All of the work that I've done on the Europeans suggests actually that it's far more likely that guys are intentionally coming because the money is absolutely huge. It's huge money. And so, and so they're seeing an opportunity for their families if they come in that late war period and enlist. And so you have guys who are stepping off the boat and immediately the day after are heading off, but they've meant to do it most of the time. So sometimes, yeah. they're, but most of the time. And so that's another one of the reasons. But. Um, yeah, that, that whole point about money reminds me of one of my favorite books that I've read in the past couple of years. Um, it's called Lincoln's Mercenaries mm. by, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, I have it right here. Uh, but, oh, yeah, William Marvell. Right, William, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, super it's actually behind me as well. <laughs> uh, but it's it's basically all about, you know, how how important a motivating factor money was uh, for, for everyone that enlisted in the Union Army. And, you know, he's making the point, which should be obvious, but, you know, there's been this inclination by people to say, oh, well, they were just in it for the money. Ergo, mm -hmm. they couldn't have possibly had any patriotic motives whatsoever. Well, I mean, you can be in it for the money and also care about the country. Uh, you know, human beings can hold multiple things at the same time. Yeah. Which, you know, <clears throat> is, such an important point. He kind of breaks it down by different kind of re recruiting class or recruiting push and all that. I mean, it's it's really incredible uh, research and it's making a great point, which is kind of tangential to what you were just saying there. 
It is. There, 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 again, I think it's an area that there needs to be improvement on, um, to be honest, uh, be, because there are guys at first bull run in 1861, in July 1861, who were there because of money. Mm -hmm. um, th there's been a kind of an artificial break, and I, I'm finishing up some work on the Irish that, that shows this. There's, there's actually, you can more or less track that it's, it's quite similar. There, there's, there's not this massive break in 63 where they all turn into a bunch of mercenaries who, who don't care. Most of them still do their duty. Um, and particularly when you have to consider that, um, uh, I think um, it's, it's Matt Galman has to figure that 60% of eligible military age men in the North chose not to go to the war at all. So, <laughs> so uh, somebody who decides that they're going to put their life on the line, and everybody knows in 1863 and 1864 what that means if you enlist. It's not like you're thinking the war's going to be over in a couple of months and there's no chance. But I mean, there's... I wrote a piece for, for the widows in the Atlantic War Project based around this, um, based around the substitute issue, based on a, a pension that was given out in Canada. And it's one of the things that's very noticeable. Again, it's always worth bringing stuff back to the Irish in, in my experience. But one of the things you do notice in relation to, uh, in relation to the pensions is Irish step migration is really important. So a good number of the British um, pensions are Irish and a good number of the Canadian pensions are Irish. But there's a, a pension that was paid out in Canada that I came across, um, and it, it, it was based around the service. It was a guy called James Ryan, his mother, and this lad had gone over to the, in, into Quebec province, um, and he was there specifically trying to get money for his mother, who was a pauper, and it was called, she was living on the parish back in County Louth, where, where she was from. So, like, she was going in and out of the poorhouse, and he was gathering the money together for her um, to try and get her across the Atlantic. And the opportunity comes to cross the border. Uh, he goes down, he's down there for the first draft and he enlists as a substitute for a guy in Vermont um, in August of 63. She lands in Canada two months later. The money he gives straight over there, this is all in the file, money is given straight over the Atlantic to get her across. And of course, he's then killed in the Overland campaign. So she never sees him again. But it's very hard to look at someone like that and go, oh, well, he's just a mercenary. Like he's, he's enlisting for a lot of the same reasons that guys are going to the war in, in, in mid-1861 are. Particularly, you know, if you look at, say, James McPherson's cause and comrades, you know, this idea that family and everything are a big part of the community. Um, Reed Mitchell as well. Like all, all of that idea is there for him as well. Like it's, he, what he's doing is by any measure honorable. He, he's, he's, and he gives his life as a result in that transaction. So, Yeah. I, I have a lot of, uh, <laughs> I think there needs to be a not done on substitutes. But that's another thing that this shows you, that these aren't a bunch of guys who are just trying to cheat the system. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're trying to better themselves. All right. Um, it, we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, in you know all this research you've done on this, uh, what can we learn through these pension records and and these maps, you know, we've talked about the maps a little bit, but, you know, what can we learn through these records uh, about the soldiers uh, who served or their surviving relatives? Um, anything in particular that you've uh, been able to draw from? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that you can tell about their, I suppose, their surviving relatives, it was specifically in an international context here, um, is you know, their feeling of entitlement to the pay from the American government because they see themselves as having sacrificed a lot for it. Um, and it kind of, for, for the women, um, if we just talk about the dependence and things for a minute, like you see a wide variety of stories as well. Like you see some people are claiming, some women here are claiming these pensions and they've been abandoned by their husbands. Their, they've, their husbands have just left and they've, they've, they've gone away. Um, and never come back. There, there's one pension I have, um, and again, it's an Irish pension in, in County Tyrone, and he had left in the, in the um, mid-1840s with the intention of getting them over. He fought in the Mexican-American War, fights through the Civil War, gets captured, Chickamauga actually dies in Andersonville, um, has remarried and everything, so he's a bigamist, and his, so his, his widow is getting the payment in Ireland on the basis that she feels entitled to it because the guy left her in the lurch for, for many years. You have others whose life is just completely put on hold. So uh, there's another, another immigrant, who, a guy who goes over for financial reasons, is supposed to bring his family across. And his family referenced this in their letters. 
he gets killed in his first engagement at the wilderness. Um, and, and they never leave. They never get to go on this new life in America that everyone around, because you need money to, to emigrate to America. And everything stops because it doesn't work out for him and the family. And right into the early 20th century, they're talking, <clears throat> excuse me, they're talking about the um, fact that this is what kind of stopped their ability to go to the United States and that the American government kind of owes them something as a result of it. Um, for the men, it's an interesting one. You know, in Ireland, one of the things in an Irish context, it tells you, even though Ireland is completely invisible under dots in that map, <laughs> as you can see there, right. there, there's only 219 pensions on this map. Yet we know in and around 180,000 Irish born men serve in the war. So immediately this is telling you that the Irish do not come back. They don't come back. So th this map that we're looking at here is actually guys, it's, it's the veterans and the dependents are all shown on this. And you can see the big cities are Dublin, um, Belfast, Derry, Cork. They're all um, represented on this. But there's a good spread. It shows you how there's people from all over the country. Um, there's a couple here, you know, there's two or three people whose sons died fighting the Nez Perce um, after the war and things like that um, in, out in the, uh, in the, um, in the Plains Indian Wars, uh, fighting Native Americans, but most of them um, are um, American Civil War veterans um, or their dependents. And so you, you get this kind of spread. Um, and I've done a bit of work looking at some of these guys. So, for example, guys who, who came back to Ireland having lost limbs during the war. So looking at guys who, who were wandering around, I always find it a fascinating image thinking of guys walking down really rural 19th century Ireland with one leg and being asked, well, what happened to you? And, and then being told, you know, there was a guy living in South Kilkenny who lost his leg after he dug a tunnel to try and escape from prison in South Carolina. And he was the first guy out of the tunnel and the Confederates had spotted that the tunnel was being, was being built. And so they waited outside for the first guy to come out and they shot him and his leg was amputated um, in the Confederacy. And, and then he heads back um, to Ireland and lives out his days for 20 or 30 or 40 years there. Um, I, you, you identify occasionally, I was doing some work on a guy in inner city Dublin recently, a Union Naval um, pensioner in Dublin, and he fell on hard times and he was very poor. He was living in a really, really poor part of Dublin um, around 1913 when Dublin is kind of kicking off in terms of um, what was going to happen in Ireland's own revolution. And the guys who were calling to check on him are fellow Union veterans who are calling in to see how he is. Mm -hmm. So again, you have that kind of connection and bond between a lot of them that you see coming through as well. Um, so th th there's, a, there's a whole host of these really interesting connections between both the men and, and the dependents. Yeah, the, a couple great points there. One, you know, so of course on, um, on this map, I mean, you're drawing lines across the Atlantic Ocean, you know, from Ireland and, you know, Germany, et cetera, to the United States. Um, but here, you know, on these maps, you know, within each country, you're, you're almost kind of drawing lines between the dots on the map itself, these kind of fraternal organizations, which, you know, appear for veterans in the United <laughs> States, uh, perhaps less formal, or maybe they are, they are formal, but, you know, less more informal versions of those appear within Ireland, just because it's likely that a number of these people were comrades. Yeah, it's, it's very informal in Ireland. I think you had to be in a big city for it to happen. It, it was a bit more organized in Britain, um, strangely enough, and interestingly enough. And I, I mean, quite a number of them were Irish um, uh, veterans, but I was doing some work on um, veterans in the northeast of England. Um, and, and so it's, it's funny how they were all brought out, um, a, a couple of them, when the, um, the United States enters the First World War, the guys who are surviving, and they talk about, oh, we have the American Civil War veterans here, and they're come out and they're, they're in the local media again. Um, and there, there's a kind of a burst, an explosion of memory after the United States enters the First World War. So for example, between the, from, from the end of the First World War through to the middle of the Second World War, the locals in Newcastle upon Tyne in the northeast of England on Memorial Day um, it, with the consul there, went round to all of the graves of the American Civil War veterans who were in the northeast of England um, and they, they had a ceremony there and they laid wreaths there and had little American flags there and it was all reported in the news. And it, it didn't survive, it seems to, when the, when the war was really getting very, very intense, um, it, the Second World War, it, do, it doesn't survive beyond that, but it kind of shows you this interesting link where people were, were looking to kind of 
identify with the people in the area who'd gone to America or had links with the United States before. And they do that through the Civil War veterans. That's fascinating. Uh, and then the, the other thing you mentioned that I thought was also a really interesting point is, uh, you know, uh, people walking around, you know, Europe, Ireland, England, whatever, with a uh, uh, missing limb, yeah. you know, which was kind of a ubiquitous scene in the United States is about 60,000 amputations performed during the conflict. Um, and so there was enough of those that happened that, you know, the, the veteran with the empty sleeve became like, you know, a trope. Uh, whereas it's, you know, not quite the same uh, in Ireland and England. And so, you know, if you're in the United States and you see someone with an amputated limb, you can reasonably suspect that it probably happened during the Civil War. But, um, you know, if you're in Ireland, it's like, oh, man, what happened to you? And it's like, yeah, wow. yeah. I, I mean, there would have been guys from the British service saying the Crimea and things like that. So it would have. I think it's just the idea that you would have the story, you know, the, the story to go with that. <laughs> well, I was in Gettysburg or I was in, you know, there was a guy in Cork I was researching not long ago, a guy called George Church. And he's one of a number of guys from the uh, same New York um, unit who lose their, their limbs. Uh, I think it's three of them came back who all lost their limbs at Jonesboro, the Battle of Jonesboro. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, you know, that's a very, <laughs> it's just not, it's not what you expect to come across, you know? So that's, it, there's a whole host of these kind of interesting little links and things that you see that come out of us um, when, when you start diving down into them that, that are really, really fascinating. You know, you see, yeah, it, got, it gets you thinking about a number of things. So one of the things that the whole project, looking at general veterans in Europe, has got me thinking about quite a lot is that you see an awful lot of naval guys coming back um, and living. So I was doing a bit of work on a guy in Amsterdam, Dutch um, naval veteran there recently. And what, <clears throat> what, what, you know, it gives me the impression now that I hadn't thought of before, that it seems to me that the Union Navy had a lot of guys, and I see it in Ireland and Britain too, who kind of enlist, they, they were kind of running the Atlantic trade, maybe delivering stuff over to America, and they're there in the middle of the war, and they suddenly think, oh, hang on here, I can make a few bob if I enlist for a year in the Navy. And they never have any intention of staying in the United States, and so they seem to have more of a propensity to come back and live and claim their pensions in Europe than maybe Army guys had who, who were kind of really dedicating themselves to the United States long term. I had one woman from Dublin whose husband, uh, she, she, she seems to have gone absolutely mad, but uh, her husband effectively went out doing a job delivering, I think it was timber or something across the Atlantic, and then kind of writes back and saying, oh, by the way, I've joined the Union Navy. <laughs> it was absolutely no, uh, no dialogue about it, nothing told, and, and that was it, it was tough. <laughs> Really. Yes, I've joined the military. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he made it back. He made it back. But, uh, oh, yeah. good. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he, uh, sure he got put in the doghouse as soon as he returned. <laughs> he did. Out. Rightly so, too. Rightly so. Uh, so, um, being of course we are the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, and we've touched on this a little bit. Uh, what insights did this project give you um, into Civil War medicine and its international dimensions? Yeah, well, one, I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to read out a couple of examples here in a second. Mm -hmm. The um, just from generally looking at pension files um, on work. But one of the things that I would say that you would you would notice an awful lot is the idea of long term injury and long, long, painful death that, that's caused by the war. So you have some of these people, a, a lot of the international ones, where the guy might even make it back for a while, two, three, four years even before, before his wounds from the war end up killing him. And you see in a lot of these files that even 20 and 30 years after the conflict, when the doctors are saying what was the cause of their death, it's the wound that they suffer in the war. So which is why which is why civil war like civil war deaths is such a challenging total number to, you know, put together because like oh, you said, you know, decades after the war there are people dying yeah. basically because of their wound, but you know, it's so long after the conflict. Anyway, oh, continue. Oh, no, absolutely. And they can never be accurate. So if we, you know, and I do it myself and we reel off a regiment's a regiment a regiment's losses in a in a particular battle and stuff, but you can look at you can look at the files then and find people two, three years later who've died as a result of the wounds. But um yeah the, the amputee uh, I mean uh, as a, as I know you've done so much work on the amputation thing really fascinates me. Um, and I was doing a lot of work generally. It was another one of these side projects, if you like this. I have too many of these side projects. But anyway, I was looking specifically um, at 
pensions of guys who had served in the 69 New York State Militia at first bull run. So a lot of the guys were the three-month men at the start, the most famous unit um, from an Irish perspective. Um, and I came across an account in one of the files um, that, that particularly interested me because it related to amputation and decisions about amputation. And so I started to have a look at a few of the other files, specifically to look at the consequences of rejecting amputation. Um, so uh, I did a bit of work on that. So not guys who, because everybody talks about, you know, they had their leg amputated and they did or they didn't survive, but there were people who didn't, who refused to have their limbs taken. Um, and so I did a bit of a review of a number of, of um, files just to see guys who didn't. And so I have a couple of what these files can bring out in terms of an account. So I have three here that I'll read if you're, if you're happy for me to dive into them. Absolutely. Um, so, so these are all men who did not have their limb amputated when, it, when, when they perhaps should have. So the first one is, these are all um, Irish examples, but the first guy is a guy called John Fleming, who was wounded in the 81st Pennsylvania Infantry at Fredericksburg. Um, and so this is the letter that his wife got um, as a result of his wounding. And it says, uh, this morning at half past one o'clock, your husband died and will be buried today at the soldier's burying ground. Before he died, he said he would like to see his wife. I asked him concerning those papers, all that I could get him to say was that he was, he was told, that he told you before he left home. When he came here, he had a bad foot, which had ought to have been amputated on the battlefield. It was in the state of mortification. It was all done for him that could be done. So John Fleming's foot should have been taken and wasn't. And it seems that it wasn't taken because he, he said no. Um, I have an Irish brigade soldier who similarly at Fredericksburg refused to have his limb amputated and died as a result of it. Um, this one is an interesting one. This is Arthur Mulholland and everybody th um, thinks about Pickett's charge in the 69 Pennsylvania um, who were there, um, the 69 Irish Pennsylvania, of course, who were at the angle there and they're, they're central um, to the entire engagement of Pickett's charge. But a number of those men were actually captured and taken back into Confederate prison. Um, and one of them was Arthur Mulholland. Um, so he's taken back across the mile of ground with, with um, all the Confederates um, at Gettysburg. But this is the statement of his wife saying he was captured at the Battle of Gettysburg. He was then taken to Bell Island, Richmond, Virginia. Before his, his capture, he was hit on the leg by a piece of a flying rail. When he got to Richmond, his leg mortified from the effects of the wound and they wanted to amputate his leg, but he would not let them. They then sent him to Andersonville, where after confinement for some time, he died and was buried there. So the rail must be one of the, the timber rails that we're all so familiar with on that part of the Gettysburg um, battlefield. Um, but this is, the, this is the one that really kind of sparked it for me. And this is the 69th New York one. And this was an account that these guys are given. So in the pensions, they're looking um, for ways to get the money. Um, so they're showing their injuries. And this is a guy called Thomas Hughes, who served in Company K, the 69th New York State Militia. And it's him and a guy called Corporal Thomas Fagan, another Irish American who was in the 14th Brooklyn at first Bull Run. And this anyway, this is his statement. I was wounded at the Battle of Bull Run, Virginia, July the 21st, 1861, in the left arm. I was then taken prisoner by the enemy and taken to Centerville, Virginia, where I met Hughes for the first time. This is Fagan speaking. And Hughes then told me he had been wounded in the same battle in the right arm and side. While at Centerville in Rebel Hospital, both suffering from their wounds, they were told that the surgeons would come round the next morning. They were advised to consent to the amputation of their arms and were told that otherwise the probability was that mortification would set in and cause death. I and Hughes spent the entire night consulting with each other and considering the matter in all its bearings and finally decided to run the risk of mortification and not to consent to amputation. This night and the attendant circumstances will never pass from my memory. Mm. That's, that's a fantastic account. Uh, that's in the stone church that happens. That's quite well known um, as, a, as a hospital after it. But they spend all night saying, will we or won't we? We, we, we might die. And they both say no in the end, and they both recover um, mm -hmm. fully, uh, fully until a number of years afterwards. And that's one of the things you see with this. I mean, obviously, there's, there's an element of, of talking up your injury in certain circumstances to try and get the money. But you do see how age impacts guys. Like, it comes back on them. You have a lot of people talk about the rheumatism that they get during their Civil War service. Varicose veins. All of this type of stuff is really, really common in these files, these kind of medical ailments that are brought on by all the, 
you know, nights after night after night, sleeping out in freezing cold weather and things like that. That has a toll on you in later life, far beyond the battlefield. So just they're interesting little insights medically into, into the impact of guys who, who don't get amputation, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's fascinating, too, because I think many people, uh, and even myself, um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's so easy to think about these surgical procedures, about how little dialogue there was between the surgeon and the patient. And in some cases, I'm sure that was the case. But, but, you know, there is some amount of kind of dialogue, you know, between the surgeon and the patient. It's not a one way street where the surgeon's like, well, it's got to come off. Um, yeah. does, doesn't matter what you think. Well, clearly, you know, at least at times, it certainly did matter. And that that kind of doctor-patient relationship, while, you know, certainly nothing like, you know, we all experience today in sort of a clinical sense, uh, is more than nothing um, during the Civil War. And that, that relationship I find particularly fascinating. Yeah, I think if you were really, really had decided that you just were not going to have, you're not going to have the amputation happen, um, and you're kind of fully compensated at the time, you're not completely delirious or anything. It seems you certainly come across it a bit where they're going, okay, we leave it then. I suppose if you're being really adamant about it, there's not much that can be done either way, you know? So um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting aspect of it. You have to think as well, and I often think about it for these, particularly the working class, and it goes back to talking about the, the, the William Marvell book, but you know, if you're a laborer, who works in the five points in New York City and you lose your arm. Like if if without a pension, you're finished anyway. But like even even at that, it's a pretty difficult um, scenario. I did a lot of work once on a on a he, he was awarded the Medal of Honor at um, Mobile Bay, um, Richard Dunphy, an, an Irish sailor who both arms were carried off by a shell at Mobile Bay. Like so he was oh. left with no arms. And his life afterwards, when you read his pension file, it just goes from bad to worse um, because he becomes an alcoholic. He has men taking advantage of him. So he, he's play, he, he, can't, he can't hold cards or anything like that. His money has to be in his top pocket. So guys hold cards for him and then cheat him at cards and take the money from his pension out of his top pocket. And his wife is desperately writing to the pension bureau saying, this is happening all the time. Can you do something about it? Because myself and my children can't support um, ourselves and and you know so that long term psychological impact of that he was a young man in his early twenties and his he, he had no he, he couldn't work after it so it's a, a bit different I think if you were in the middle or upper classes you know where you were some of the white collar where you could kind of go back to work um, and you do see there's an effort to look after guys then you you, you do see that um, a bit where where the state might employ a few of them they might get employed in the state house and things like that after the war if they've been amputated particularly if they've lost both limbs both arms Mm -hmm. yeah it's uh became becomes a very different world uh for people that receive amputations and you know there are uh, a variety of kind of ways to look at it uh brian jordan has a book entitled marching home yeah which uh that one offers a pretty bleak look um for for the world that uh, veterans return to, um, y- even if you didn't have an amputation uh, done, um, it's yeah. definitely fertile, fertile ground for, uh, for further research. But yeah, it's, it's right. a, a wide range of outcomes, a lot of them, unfortunately, pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you had uh, a few other kind of specific examples uh, in your PowerPoint. Did you want to um, tackle either of those? Yeah, there's a couple. Of, there's an interesting one I always use. It might be because the one pension, um, and I use it. I, I teach a seminar in, in Edinburgh every year, and I always use it. Um, it's to it's the um, relates to um, the only Liberian pension. So there's a I think it's a passenger list I sent you there. There's, but um, this is a really interesting um, one um, because, as I said, it was only one pension being paid out in. Uh, it, the entire continent of Africa, um, and yeah. that's uh, a. Diff- I, I, I was curious about that. I, I I saw that dot on the map. I'm like, I wonder what that's about. Yeah, yeah. This is this is is it this picture here? No, this is a slightly different one, but this is also worth talking about. Um, and th- that's just showing us some of the injuries. This so this is one of the guy's pension files there, and if you look on the left, you can see where it says bullet entry and bullet exit, and he's talking about a whole list of ailments. 
Um, this is Thomas Dunphy from the 69 New York State Militia. So he has this huge range of kidney and heart failure, total deafness to the left ear, partial deafness to the right ear. You get this a bit, guys, talking about deafness brought on by things like artillery and stuff. Um, obviously, they're, they're looking to try and throw as much stuff at this to try and make sure they get the pension. But that, that's what um, some of their original files looked like. Um, it's worth actually just going back, maybe, um, John, we can, the, yeah, so th this one is a really interesting one. This gets at the heart, um, and I, I wrote a piece for the Clara Barton um, um, Museum um, and the site on, on this. But in 1893, a lot of these European and international pensioners were thrown under the bus by the uh, US government because a new law was brought in in 1893 that stated that you had to prove that someone was a US citizen in order to maintain the pension. So what you had was you had a whole load of, of um, now elderly women who had lost their husbands in the war. A lot of them had never been to America and they effectively got letters like this. This was one sent to rural West Mayo in Ireland. Um, and it, it was sent to this woman who probably couldn't read it in the first place. I'm telling her that unless she could prove her husband was a citizen of the United States, her pension was going to be stopped by a specific date. And it had been brought in, pensions were a hugely political issue um, in the 19th century United States. And it had been brought in ostensibly to try and stop fraud and things like this, because there, there was a lot of fraud in the pension system. But it just created this absolute catastrophe for international pensioners. And I've seen it in Scandinavian pensions, German pensions, French pensions, Irish pensions, Canadian pensions. All of these people just all of a sudden being told your pension stops um, and you get women their response is to write directly to President Cleveland. They are, a lot of them are doing that saying my husband or my son died for the United States of America and now you're stopping this money. I've been relying on it and going into the poor house. They, all, they say this all over um, Europe. It's reported widely in the press both in the US and in places like Ireland as well. Um, and eventually there's such a weight brought to bear on it that they kind of think better of it And a couple of years. Um, in, by 1895, they've restored them all. But you can imagine how impossible it would be if you, if, if you, came, if you came from a rural part of, of Sweden and you're being told that you now have to prove. Like, and again, these are poor enough people. They don't have very many personal possessions. They almost certainly have nothing from their husband's time in the United States. And they're being told that they have to some way prove their, their husband was a citizen of the United States at the time they died. Uh, apart from the fact altogether that there were quite a number of them who weren't citizens of the United States when they died in service, which is, a, is another major point to make. Right. But, they, these, these type of letters are all over these international files and uh, they, a significant amount of a lot of them, anyone, anyone who was claiming a pension at this time, there's material from around the 1893, I call it the international pension crisis. And I think it's gone under the radar quite a lot because it hasn't really been looked at, but it, that really did have a massive impact on people living outside the US. But yeah, that's, that's that document. The woman called it and Walsh got that. Okay, and then we got this one here. Yeah, that's, a, that's a quite an interesting one. So that's, this is an actual pension certificate. So this okay. is what you were awarded. And this is what you went with to claim your money. You needed to have it to claim your money. And this one always fascinates me because this one, which is did, now, did you did you need to physically go in person with this, yeah, even if yeah. even if you live in Sweden or Germany or wherever? Well, you had to go to your local, so the money was oh, the money sent local, the, the consulate. Then you, then you would take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it. that it was very important. So if you lost them, um, you had to apply for a new one and everything. So um, and so and you see a lot of fraud when when women. Um, have given their certificates to say an agent to do stuff for them and the agent might be cheating them. So you see a lot of that type of stuff. But this one really interested me because um, this one was spent decades where I'm talking to you from, from a couple of miles down the road. It spent its time there. It's now back in the um, National Archives in Washington, D.C. So it's had quite a journey, this. Um, but it's, you can see it's really worn and, and it was used. So this is the, the widow of a man, Michael Beatty, um, who lost his leg at Chancellorsville as a result of Chancellorsville. Um, and he's in and out um, of hospitals for quite a period of time. I think he's 10 months. Um, he's in hospital after Chancellorsville. Um, and eventually he comes out and he spends some time in the soldier's home. Um, and then he comes back to Ireland and he marries in East County Cork um, in the 1870s to this guy, Nora, uh, to this woman, Nora Beatty. 
Um, and so he, he's um, going down to Queenstown across the water from me and talking about the carbuncles that he's getting on the base of his stump and the problems he has with that. Um, and this is an interesting one. I'll actually read you a bit of a document on this, if that's okay. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting circuit. Um, so Nora claims the pension after he dies, after Michael dies. Um, but again, she's having to prove a lot of things. And so what particularly in Ireland you would do is the local Catholic parish priest was like, he, he was um, one of the people who had power in society who working class people had access to, one of the only people they could access. Um, and so one of the people who writes for Nora, um, who owned this certificate, is Father O'Connell, who is the parish priest of Castle Martyr in County Cork. And he writes this letter to America in September 1887. And you can see he's not messing around with the US government in this now. Uh, he says, this is the certified that the widow of Michael Beatty with her young helpless family is living in this parish. Regarding her claims on the American government for pension, the statements put forward by her are perfectly accurate and truthful. As to what doctor attended him, or who were his companions when he received the wound, this is a chancellor's will, which deprived him of his leg, it is utterly impossible for her to make out. She'd never been in America. Indeed, it is hardly fair of the Pension Commission to require such information from a poor, illiterate creature at this side of the Atlantic. It is a well-known fact that her deceased husband received his pension regularly, and the wound received in the American service so undermined his constitution as to bring on the fatal sickness which brought him to an untimely grave. This is in the mid-1880s, he dies of the wounds he gets the chances. Under these circumstances, I have no difficulty in saying that the pension commissioner is not only bound in honour, but in justice, to come without further delay to the relief of the afflicted widow and helpless children. So he is not holding back in relation to saying that the American um, Pension Bureau needed to get his act together. Um, and they did, and, and she, she receives her pension. And she received it um, all the way through until her death in 1921. And that's when the certificate is returned to the, for the closure of her file. So wow. when the War of Independence was raging in her part of East Cork, actually, the Irish War of Independence. So, you know, that kind of links to all of this history. is fascinating. Mm -hmm. so the back of that document is covered, the, of the certificate we're looking at now, is covered with things like lists with money on it and little scribbles and people seemingly learning how to write it's just covered in all these different colored pens so you can see how it was almost a functional document in the household it's mm -hmm. an amazing artifact wow yeah that's cool and and talking about tying things together i mean it, it's it's always neat to see that's you know why objects are so cool they yeah. they they're this kind of tangible link that ties not only us now looking at this to the past, uh, but also various events throughout history that it was kind of adjacent to. I mean, it's, uh, you, you gotta yeah. love it. They're amazing. They're amazing. Yeah, it's really good. But um, yeah, and I, I suppose with the, 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 the Nancy Askey one, this is, a, this is a big favorite of mine. Like I really like this because it's how an international pension file can allow you to explore multiple facets of both American and international history. So this is a woman um, who was from Bertie Car County in North Carolina, um, and she was enslaved there. Um, and she had, um, she, she was owned by um, a man called Andrew Askew, who was a big Democrat um, in the local area, um, and was very involved politically and very involved in stuff like the, um, um, wanting to make sure that the preservation of slavery um, continued. Uh, and he makes lots of public commentary in the local press about this through the 1840s and 50s. But um, I use this as a teaching tool because Nancy is claiming this pension in Liberia, in a place called Arthington um, in, in Liberia. Um, and you can go all the way back to actually, we are, uh, almost certainly know which person she is on the slave schedules of, the, of 1860 now because of her age, um, e even though, as, as um, everybody be aware, they, enslaved people were not named on that census only the owner was named so but you can identify her um and she married a, a man called george askey so they both had the name of um, people um who enslaved them at the time married him in the 1840s and one of the really strong things about the pension files from an african-american perspective is it gives you this real insight into into plantation life and things that are often you don't get unless you're looking at the, the wpa narratives and things but two of the people who give statements for Nancy and her pension were enslaved with her. And they talk about, this is a quote, being slaves, they were not allowed to marry by any form or ceremony, only by their mutually consenting to live and cohabit together as man and wife. 
So she has married this man, George, in 1843. They have around 12 children. All of them are born into, into enslavement. And then the Union Army comes to Plymouth, North Carolina, just a bit down the river. And George goes and he enlists in what is the third North Carolina Colored Volunteer Infantry, the 37th USCT. He's 40 years old at the time. They fight through, actually, they see some very hard campaigning in Virginia. And this is, you know, you're never too far away from real, real heartbreak there. He survives the war. He gets home and everything. And on the 4th of January, 1867, two days before his three-year term is over, he's bringing um, timber out to Fort Sumter. And it gets, the boat he's on gets rocked by a wave. And a couple of guys go in and the other guy can swim properly and George can't and he drowns. Um, oh, boy. And that's after all he'd been through during the war and, and before the war and everything. And so this is what happens um, for Nancy. But so Nancy spends a few years there. And Bertie County, um, again, it's not, it's, not, it's not really my specialist area, if you like, but Bertie County seems to be particularly bad. Um, one of the really bad areas after the war in terms of violence towards free people. Um, and so dealing with a lot of that, there seems to be a big move of um, African-American immigrants out of the place. And so the American Colonization Society, which was trying to move people to Liberia, by this point really isn't having much success anymore. Their, their, their kind of time had gone. Um, but if we look at this list of immigrants um, of 1870 from per Bertie County, you can see just down towards the bottom, number 37, Nancy Askew. And that's Nancy, the widow of the Civil War veteran. And she's not alone there. And uh, number 27 there, that's actually Bryant Askew. I mean, he was a veteran of the same unit, the 37th USDT. So you have all of these African-American veterans and widows um, who are going to Liberia on the promise um, of, of where they would go, uh, on the promise of what might be there for them. Um, and wh where their descendants are today now, it's an extraordinarily poor place. Um, it's, it's a bit upriver from Monrovia. Um, and I always end with this. You can look at where, the, you know, the, the whole rain in, in North Carolina, which is kind of the area we're from, and the area now um, that, that, that they went to, on the promise of a lot better life, it's a kind of a tough, um, it's a tough story from start to finish, but it takes you all the way through this incredible narrative of the American Civil War from about two decades prior to it to about two decades after it. And, and one of the really interesting things is the community they build in Liberia. There's people giving affidavits there who've known her all her life. So they're all from the same few plantations who are all living these, these incredible lives in Liberia afterwards. So yeah, a, an incredibly moving story. And it says its own tale that there must have been many, many people um, quite a number of them at least, who were eligible for American pensions in Liberia, but she was the only one who got one. She, it was a couple of years after she actually arrived in Liberia before she realized that she could still claim it abroad. You get that a bit when people have um, been in America and maybe come away. So maybe a widow has lost their husband and the American dream has died for them and they go home to their families, that they're, that they're often not immediately aware that they can claim um, the pensions internationally. Mm -hmm. Man, what a what an incredible story and uh, mostly a tragic one. Uh, well, I mean, anytime you're dealing with widows, of course, it's is rarely going to be a happy yeah. story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I've given out to a bit. I have to do, uh, do more uplifting stuff um, yeah. for quite a bit. But they are so compelling because the information in them is just so unique. It's their voices, mm -hmm. their voices that it would not exist only for... Um, and I'm speaking specifically about working class ordinary people, be they African American people who were formerly enslaved, or be they German, Irish, or Scandinavian um, ordinary people. They're very hard people to, to get at their experiences. Anyway. Right. Um, yeah, and and it strikes me too that that you know that that tactic that you use so often is um, I think so impactful if you if you find you know, some rich stories to just kind of latch on to a, a single person as you're going through and like, hmm, this seems interesting. I wonder if there's more here. And then taking that name and, you know, poking around in other places. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it's turned up a, a lot of fruit for you over the years. And I think it's yeah. a brilliant way to kind of attack it. it leads to some really compelling stories. If anyone wants to lose a decade, it's definitely the way to go about it. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my! Well, this has been uh, this has been wonderful uh, today, Damien. Thank you so much for um, for coming Thanks back for and me. joining us. Yeah, really. uh, and you know the, the the rate things are going. Maybe we'll have you back again a third time. Um, <laughs> anytime, anytime. I love to. So yeah, we have, we'll have we'll have you on quarterly because we had you on last <laughs> summer. This is kind of fall time. We'll have you on this winter, and and uh, we'll we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll see how it goes. A recurring feature, a recurring feature with widows, yeah, be good. That's right. Uh, yeah, here's our quarterly check-in with Damien. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you, yeah. I love it. Uh, well, thank you for being here. Thank you out there watching with us. I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed this and definitely check out irishamericancivilwar.com. It's a, a labor of love for Damien and filled with a host of incredible information. So check that out. Uh, be sure to like this video, share our video, like us on Facebook. All of these things are incredibly helpful to us. Uh, and uh, tune in tomorrow at three o'clock uh, Eastern time for another of our live streams talking about strange tales of Civil War medicine, uh, all the ghoulish, ghostly and ghastly true stories of Civil War medicine should be, uh, should be a good time and we hope to see you there. And if you can, um, please become a member uh, of the museum. Uh, our, our members support educational programming like this. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this and other uh, videos that we've done, becoming a member helps us, um, helps us out so much. So with that, uh, this is John and Damien signing off. We'll see you, uh, well, in three or four months, probably for uh, <laughs> Damien Well anyway. I'll see you tomorrow. So till then.